uh, changed his mind about whether humans had, uh, had, stopped, had stopped evolving. I answered the question about changing my mind, and I won't give my answer because it takes too long to explain. However, um, I will say that uh, in response to Craig Venter today, I am prepared to change my mind if he gives a better answer to my question <laughs> about molecular taxonomy. Maybe now is not the time to do it, but I'm on the brink of changing my mind, but I remain highly skeptical as to whether um, I will in fact have to do so. We'll have to go through some genome data as we follow up on this. But, uh, yeah. but, but I, you know, I, I think Pinker thought there was no human evolution because he spent so much time at a university. Uh, Yes, my name is Julius Ender from Handelsblatt. Uh, we talked a lot, a lot about of design and uh, technical uh, things. How about soul? Uh, science tried to figure out where our soul sits. Where is it in your, uh, in your mind, Mr. Venter? Uh, the question is about where does the soul sit. Um, either the soul doesn't exist at all, and I don't believe it does exist in the sense of anything outside the brain, or it is a manifestation of brain activity. Uh, I certainly would um, think it highly, highly unlikely that there's anything like uh, a soul that survives the death of the brain. So I think that one of the aspects of the revolution in biology is a, a complete destruction of dualism and of obscurantist mystification. David Feynman, Ben Gurion University. Um, Craig's comment about being able to, perhaps in the future, take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and create uh, fossil fuels, uh, good ones because one's not digging them out of the ground, is admirable. Um, of course, it's always dangerous to try and predict what kind of future technologies uh, will be, but it seems that to me that there are two classes of technological solutions that might be able to use your invention when you come up with it. One would be some kind of black box that takes the carbon dioxide um, in the immediate vicinity of the black box and converts it into fuel. And the problem here is that you only have about 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so you would require an enormous amount of process energy to be able to get enough carbon dioxide to make the kind of quantities of fuel that we need. The other broad class of technological solution would be perhaps you could create some kind of enzyme or whatever you would call it um, that would take advantage of the huge surface area of the oceans and you could sort of then put it in the ocean and then it would then take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and convert itself into oil but then we would have the problem of the oceans covered with oil, uh, another undesirable solution. There are thoughtful questions. Uh, the first about the concentration of CO2 is relatively easy to deal with. The, the KMs of the enzymes and these organisms that exist throughout our planet are able to capture CO2 out of the atmosphere, out of the water, but we don't need to rely on that. We have two phenomenal and soon a third point source of carbon dioxide. The two largest are power plants and cement factories. If we could simply capture back the CO2 from those two point sources, it makes it very easy because of the incredible concentrations you have there and eventually get in a cycle of a renewable source from that. We also have a third. It's sequestered carbon dioxide from a variety of sources that's been discussed to be pumped down into oil wells or coal beds. So we are working uh, in, as one of our programs with BP, trying to look at converting that CO2 back into methane so you could constantly be in a recycling mode. Uh, once you sequester CO2, we can use that as a source of energy instead of constantly taking more out of the ground. So we have so many incredible point sources of CO2 production right now. That, that's the least of our worries. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for coming. We're out of time.
Thank you. <laughs>